My name's Pete Woods. You're watching Hexham TV. Who are you? Hi, I'm Mark Richards. I'm an outdoor writer based near Brampton on the western flank of Hadrian's Wall. So, Mark, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and how you came to be a, a walker and a writer and an artist. Well, it goes back a long time, of course, like anybody with grey hair. <laughs> <laughs> Brought up on a farm in West Oxfordshire. First 40 years of my life was involved with farming, but in my early 20s, through a, a love of pen and ink drawing, I became a good friend of Alfred Wainwright through one of those unusual and quirky connections that somebody else linked, linked us together. And um, because I had a great love of the landscapes of the North, because my mother's family came from the North Pennines, this my summer holidays were spent in in the dales and and with visits to the lake district so inevitably it was deep rooted in me that somehow or other i would wish to be come connected and learn more about that landscape and because of aw's encouragement i got into writing guidebooks and all my early guidebooks were hand written and drawn and hand scribed in the wainwright manner and indeed, my first Hadrian's Wall book, uh, which was called The Wall Walk, was hand-scribed. I've got a copy with me here now. I don't know if you can see it there. Uh, it's probably in reverse on the screen, but it's all handwritten, hand-illustrated. And, and it, it, it covered the route from Segedunum across to Bowness on Solway with uh, diagrammatic maps and so forth. It was... Uh, very much built on Wainwright's tradition, but there again, but it's entirely my own work. And uh, Professor David Breeze, who I've long had a connection, uh, loved it because it was part of that traditional presentation of material that from the Collingwood Bruce a age, where everything was handscribed or uh, etched and before the photography, photography came on the scene. So all my early work was, was done like that. So I did, a, the wall walk and then I did wall country walks oh, in reverse. How do I show it the right way around on your screen? <laughs> that's there? perfect. It looks perfect to me here, Mark. Yes, but that's all pen and ink and uh, line drawings and such like. And uh, so I had that long connection from the early 90s with creating a guidebook to walking this, the width of Hadrian's Wall and exploring the, the depths of the landscape. So making my mark on the landscape, as it were. That's my first pun. And uh, the, the notion that Hadrian's Wall is writ deep in the landscape was something I wanted to uh, understand. And so I've, I've got, this year marks the 30th anniversary of my first guide to Hadrian's Wall. So I've got that long connection. Of course, the Lake District became my earliest ambition. And uh, from my early walks with Alfred Wainwright, I walked the, the central section of his coast to coast with him on his original research. I walked from Shap through to Richmond. So that really got me into the feeling of how a real uh, a guidebook writer operates. And uh, so I have that unique perspective. Um, but I wanted to, like anybody who uh, wants to relate to a landscape, I wanted to make it my own as well. And so ultimately I came up with the idea of doing, I did other guidebooks to the Cotswolds um, and Cornish Coast, where my father's family had connections. And then I was drawn up to the Lake District uh, and by, well, originally Walt Unsworth, who founded the um, Cicerone Press, his, um, he was editor of the great uh, the Climber and Rambler magazine, and he in the late nineteen eight uh, late seventies seventies invited me to contribute to his magazine, and then he asked me to produce a set of guidebooks in my handscribed manner to the Peak District, and ultimately he in the early about nineteen ninety asked me would I come and look at Hadrian's Wall and do the same thing there. And so that was my first connection with that. Although I met my wife through Offers Dyke, 
and I wrote a guidebook to Office Dyke, again, a hand-scribed guide. So I've had that long connection with exploring historic landscapes with my pen. And uh, so when I did Hadrian's Wall, uh, the wall walk, that really got me to f into the field. And this is 10 years before the National Trail came on the scene and a Waymark route, and therefore 10 years before people even thought or dreamt of walking coast to coast along the frontier. Historically, people had done this, but only antiquarians or quirky, unusual people per se, not the average run of the mill person who think, wow, I could do that, which is wonderful that they can. But it, what it meant was I got this feeling that Hadrian's Wall was precious and it was something that needed to be cared for. Uh, so I came to it from that and I continue with that perspective. And therefore, I've gone on and produced guidebooks and material that reflects that. And one example of that was the book I produced with David Brees, uh, which is Hadrian's War, A Journey Through Time. See my pen drawing. And this looks at the 300 year history of Hadrian's War in photographs and in line drawings, um, but identifies what you can read in the landscape today that covers the full span of Roman jurisdiction. And that is a fascinating aspect that's not often emphasized. So it's, it's, it's about tutoring that history is something you can, anybody can read if you've got the tools to read it with. And so I've got involved with that. And it was published by Bookcase in Carlisle. And uh, it's a paperback and um, it, it's not, not very commonly seen because it's published in a very small way. Um, and it's a cumbersome thing, but it's just, well, it's thin, but uh, because it's not marketed well, uh, it, it, not many people know about it, but I, I think it should be more widely observed, but it, it's part of my desire to care for this landscape and tutor people to get more out of getting to know the area. And, um, and so my tr when the trail, National Trail came along, of course, inevitably, I produced a guide to it, which was continued on from the Wall Walk and Cicerone published it. And, the, and uh, just this week, the fourth um, uh, edition of this guide with its uh, map book, uh, that will be going to the printers in China, would you believe? <laughs> I've produced other small guides to the Lake District, which are printed in Penrith. H&H <laughs> &H reads, uh, and they do a superb job. And that, I, because I do a podcast as well, a, a fortnightly podcast on Cumbria, uh, uh, the, the guy I do that with, we produce guidebooks um, uh, to encourage people to use the local bus to explore. And um, and that's all pen and ink and so on. Anyway, so Hadrian's Wall, I, I, I've kept up this strong connection and uh, I, I see no reason why um, uh, people should not come and enjoy it and get more uh, as much that pleasure from it into the future as they've done in the past. And I ho hope I've contributed to that appreciation of this magical place, which then led me on. Well, I, I did a, walk, a, a book with Hexham based photographer Roger Clegg. Oh, yes. Spirit we of Hadrian's We know Wall. Roger, yeah. Well, then, Roger. And, it, and it's a wonderful collection. And this is done in 2009. Uh, a, a lovely book because Roger has this great collection, this lovely feel for photography, getting up at crack of dawn. He's over the years had, had great pleasure at doing that. Um, I reflect on beyond that that a few couple of years before that, 2006, I produced the wall walk, uh, no, the Roman ring, which was a circular walk that went around the central section of Hadrian's Wall that introduced that near country. So people could actually explore a little bit off the actual mural line of the wall to get to know it. Of course, that didn't, that was only marketed through Shepherd's Walks and didn't get, publicity either so you know uh, in order to get any publication to the wider world you've got to put a lot of legwork in yourself i tend to get involved with producing the book uh, and then move on to the next book because <laughs> there's always another book uh, but um 
working with Cicerone, of course, that is a national publisher based in Cumbria, and they do fabulous books all over the world, titles covering all aspects of the great outdoors. And so working with them has been very special for me over the years. And, and my Lakeland guides, eight volume guide to all the fells, great mountain days, 50 great walks in the Lake District, great books to produce. And it, they only survive because they're handled through a, a proper publisher, as it were. Um, so so I've got I've got this lovely feeling of connection with these places, but I want people to understand what they're looking at when they're in, in, in the countryside. My Lakeland one's my original version of it because it's gone through three incarnations, three editions. It, they, they, they've squeezed them down to make them more pocket sized because my big originally they were slightly larger and I had panoramas with graphics um, captioned to every summit of every fell. Even Wainwright didn't go to that extent. Um, but that's because I just want people to understand where they are because very often people only climb one fell. So if they go up Skidder or Cat Bells, I like them to understand where they are. You know, where I live, uh, I live in Geltsdale. So I can go up Cold Fell or I can go up Talking Fell and I can pick things out, you know, from Talking Fell, back of my house, you can see the Chiviot and you can see the Gall far Galloway Hills and beyond Criffle uh, and you can see down to, to, to Scorefell Pike. So you've got magic viewpoints um, uh, and people discover them. And once they discover what you can see and you need to be able to tool people up to, to, to describe what they can see and how to see things, they suddenly feel this wonderful connection with places. And there's lots more to beyond the landscape. The, the foreground is so important. Understanding what you're standing on, the rocks or the uh, management land form that the farmers have done, the wall builders have done. There's so much you can read in the landscape. And that's the purpose of a guidebook writer, to put people one step on from the norm, one's normal knowledge. Um, invariably, most people walk uh, uh, as groups and they get in conversation. And occasionally they may ask a question of one another, what is such? But unless the, who they are with knows what they're talking about, it, it, it gets lost. And, um, and I invariably walk on my own, but I converse with lots of people. Uh, I talk to farmers and that I find very useful. Uh, and, and I talk to historians or archaeologists and that builds up my perspective from a much greater discipline. Um, because uh, it, although well, I can observe things, I can read things, but what you need is that scholarship that, uh, uh, that a historian uh, brings to a subject. And I try to feed that into my guidebooks. And, uh, and knowing that there are limits to my understanding and uh, it, it, we all have a, a certain level of humility that we must show in pro providing information about places. But ostensibly, I... I love exploring this landscape and whether, whether you're a Geordie or a, or a man from Carlisle, eh? <laughs> everybody, everywhere has its quirkiness and, that, and it's lovely to be able to find it and discover something new. So the little book that I've produced for Cicero, the latest one, 15 short walks along Hadrian's Wall. And if you live in Hexham, uh, you can reach two thirds of the walks using the local bus, which is marvelous. Uh, so you don't even need to get into your car. Uh, uh, but uh, this book actually concisely describes the landscape immediately close to Hader's Wall. And is a very good stepping stone into understanding more about it. All the walks are circular. So you do, you, uh, you do see different aspects of things and uh, and I've done my utmost to be to craft the walks to be not just circular walks but something each one of them has a purpose in uh, in the building blocks of understanding of what makes Hadrian's Wall such a special heritage feature and why it is a world heritage site and it, and it and plays into a, a much bigger picture of um, culture 
because the Romans, of course, brought people from all around their empire to, to garrison the fort. They had towns, you could describe, each Roman fort was a town because it had a, a big uh, civ a civil settlement around it, which serviced all aspects of, of the needs of that place. So we know of Corbridge today, uh, there was a, a town of Corbridge around the fort. The town has migrated a little bit east, but all the forts were actually rather like that. But of course, that one had a, a major R Roman road, which exists to this day, the A68. But other uh, Roman roads were uh, have fallen away a good deal because of the changing emphasis. But you learn so much about the current landscape by looking at the Roman landscape. So and they do give it up. I was just going to say, Mark, with your latest book, um, there that you've just shown us. Presumably they're all accessible walks, are they, for people who, you know, who may not be um, used to walking as much as perhaps some other people, you know, some established walkers are? Clearly the, the, the primary purpose of this new series, short walk series that Cicerone have developed, as is a tutor, tutorial to people first since COVID, a lot of new walkers have emerged and, and young people who want to learn about what the Great Outdoors is all about. And there are more elderly people, of which of course I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just old. <laughs> but no, uh, but can venture into these landscapes. So these walks, are none of them are challenging. Uh, they're quite unlike the Lake District guidebooks I've done, which have scrambling and serious ascent involved. Uh, the, the, these have even got what three word um, pinpoints on each walk. So, you know, uh, very modern, you can get on your computer, uh, uh, iPhone and, and you can find exactly where the three meter square where you start from and everything's geared to modern perspectives. Um, most, it, it, this is one of the issues of the current age. Everybody uses a, a smartphone for everything, as it were. I don't say everybody, because I, I, I don't probably a, apply in that, because I use a map and I use an, um, my own intuition about a place. And of course, I know about certain places. I don't need to use an iPhone to get me to places. But most people do. But the, uh, they have downloadable GPXs. Uh, in here so that the um, uh, so you can follow the route on your iPhone from this is it GPX I think that's what they call it uh, and so the um, so all the routes are in there so you, if, in addition and, and this is what we have to do these days in a guidebook is offer um, smartphone um, connectivity yeah. tell me Mark um, most people will have seen Alfred Wainwright's um, guidebooks you know and seen the style of them and that sort of thing what was he like as a person uh, uh, probably exactly what you might guess uh, ostensibly self-absorbed and not um he wouldn't converse with people i converse with him uh, but there again i walk with him and his wife a good deal and we were in, we, we were in, uh, on focus of what he was trying to do on that given day um he would go, when i was sitting with him in his sitting room suddenly he would ghost away upstairs and get on with some drawing and i'd find myself and I'd, i i would have blinked him whenever he'd gone uh, <laughs> um, so I got a lot of chats with his wife, but there again, when he came down, sat with, had a cup of tea, I get a, a good, good bit of chatter about the things that he really loved. And he loved his mountains. He loved the Scottish mountains. And he, 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 he only subscribed to one magazine that I ever saw. It was a magazine called Mountain. Uh, and this had international mountains in it. So he really was into the pleasure of the outdoors in that sphere that um, many might not really realize um it's interesting to see he, uh, he 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 enjoyed talking to people but only at a certain level but what he did love to do was communicate and write to people and his 
um, he was incredibly, um, uh, he wrote so many letters, it's unbelievable really. I've got loads of letters and postcards he sent me from when he went to Scotland, putting together his Scottish mountain drawing series. Before he started that series, actually, I introduced him to the idea of doing, following the Cambrian Way. A friend of mine had devised this route from Cardiff to Conway over the highest ground in Wales. So it's like a, combina uh, a continuation of his coast to coast idea, but traversing all the magical wild places in Wales. And he said, yeah, well, OK, I'll do that. But I'll start at Aberystwyth and go up to Conway. Mark, <laughs> you can do from Cardiff up to Aberystwyth. <laughs> so he, he got to that point. Uh, we sort of worked it out what he was going to do. And then he, he got back to me and said, no, I really must get all those Scottish mountains sorted out first. Of course, then he ever, never got back to the Cambrian Way. Of course, funny thing is, of course, now it, Cicero and have a guide to the Cambrian Way. And now with the new vogue and understandable notion of re-establishing Welsh names as predominant, as it should be culturally is correct. So you, the Brecon Beacons is now Banai Brecon Eggiog or something, I can't be exact, um, but it's all because the purpose of national parks and particular landscapes is to reframe what the purpose of a national park is all about. It's not just a recreational environment, it's a statement uh, of caring for the, the, the habitats and nature, water drainage, all sorts of aspects have to be taken into consideration. And so there, so the Cambrian Way wouldn't be, in the modern guys, wouldn't be called the Cambrian Way, it would be called a Gumri path or something. It, um, it would have, um, I created a route in Wales, actually. I did a lot of work for Paris County Council, country walks for them, and I, Created, I uh, came up with the idea of a journey between the Tannant Valley and the Berwins to a little church at Pennant Menangleth. So I called it the, the Menangleth Way. No. Uh, um, and they changed the name to Perionid Menangleth, the pilgrimage to Penang St. Menangleth. Yeah. Uh, and and Waymarked and produced a guidebook in Welsh. Um, and they in invited me to a little uh, opening service in the church at, at St. Menangleth, uh, which was very touching because the entire service was conducted in Welsh. Um, uh, and this is my little contribution to their. And for a, actually for a period of a year, I edited a magazine called Walking Wales before I moved up to Cumbria, which was fascinating because it meant that I could talk to all sorts of people throughout the Welsh landscape who had a, a connection with the environment and the walking world. And uh, that I find fascinating, which is why I love doing my uh, fortnightly podcast. I say my podcast, I'm just a presenter. Uh, I have a, a partner, David Felton, who's chairman of the Friends of the Lake District, who for the last nearly five years together have produced this countrystride.co.uk podcast which looks at all sorts of aspects of the environment, the culture, the heritage, many aspects of Cumbria from Walney Island up to Hayden's Wall. And in fact, our next one is probably going to be recorded next week, which will be episode 102, because 101 goes live on Friday, which is all about the Yellow Earl of Lowther Castle. Uh, the next one, 2002, uh, will be took two half netters either side of the solway in conversation that should be interesting uh, <laughs> the thing you could do on a podcast you could talk uh, uh, rather like your backdrop drop to your hexam tv uh, conversation now with the 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 tyne there uh, nicely dammed up to look like a wonderfully broad river uh, <laughs> We'll be doing the same thing with the Solway, which will be fun. <laughs> a, Scots a Scotsman and an Englishman, uh, but there won't be an Irishman involved. <laughs> <laughs> the beginning of a joke there somewhere. <laughs> anyway, Mark, half that is the hotel. Anyway, go on. What's your favourite walk? Well, as uh, as most people intelligently who love exploring would always say, 
my last one or the one yeah. I'm on. I've just uh, last work uh, last Tuesday I climbed Skidder, and that was wonderful. Uh, although Scotland was not there because it was lost in the haze, everything else was there. Uh, I'll, I'll be out tomorrow. I'll, I'll walk from Ross Rosthwaite into the Stonethwaite Valley, up to Dock Tarn and down to Wattenleth, and right the way through down to Great Wood and Keswick. That'll be magic. Um, there are so many wonderful walks. Uh, I I am so delighted that I live in this greater landscape of Cum Cumberland, Westmoreland, uh, Northumberland. This is all a magical place. There's no such thing as the best. There's always the the elements conspire to make every walk different, and um, keep be, keep curiosity going. And I, that's what I love. Uh, I was one of my early uh, mentors was a chap called Mickey Aston, who was one of the archaeologists in Time Team. And before he got on television, he was uh, at the extramurals department in Oxford, and he ran courses on reading the landscape in the Cotswolds. And I joined one of his courses in, in my early 20s, and it was absolutely magical. And I, if I hadn't been a farmer at the time, I might have become an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't have the background education. I was trained to be a farmer. Um, but, um, but my love of pen and ink drawing and my love of walking meant that I was steered more by Alfred Wainwright and others. But... Um, I've, I've had lots of inspiration from different styles of artists down the years, uh, and uh, and that has been looking at a view and trying to encapsulate it. Encapsulate it has been always very been important to me. So that's what walking is all about: looking at a landscape and, and trying to encapsulate what's special about it. Mark. Did I stop there? <laughs> <laughs> A rare moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Verbal chewing gum, my boy. <laughs> Mark, it's been fascinating talking to you and hearing about um, your books, your walking, um, your love of the landscape, um, your podcasts, and um, the characters, including Wainwright, who uh, you've met along the way. So... Uh, if people want to find out more, Mark, um, just give us the um, uh, Cicerone Press and um, your podcast and yep. website details. Yeah, that's it. The Cicerone Press, uh, you can find that quite easily on the internet. Uh, um, they have Twitter and so forth. Uh, uh, they, they publish all the time different titles, uh, but... Um, uh, Cicerone and um, countrystride.co.uk is my podcast. Great, great. And you, well, my own web, my own website is markrichardswalking.co.uk. But better to go to Country Stride and to Cicerone to find out what's what's active and vital and changing. Mark, thank you very much for talking to Hexham TV. It's my pleasure. <laughs>